Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Christina Rendon with KTVU Fox News out of the San Francisco Bay Area. And joining us today is Dr. Vanila Singh, former Chief Medical Officer of the U.S. Health and Human Services and Clinical Associate Professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Singh, we always appreciate you joining us today. And let's just start with Operation Warp Speed. That was the big talk, uh, the, the news that came out on Friday about President Trump uh, creating this task force and trying to find a vaccine for the coronavirus by the end of the year. Is that a realistic timeline? Well, good afternoon, Christina. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is like the big news out of uh, the White House on Friday with the announcement of Operation Warp Speed. And just like the title says, the project is really to advance at a, at a uh, really rapid pace the development of the vaccine, which is really going to be critical to reassuring people and regaining confidence that we can definitely re-engage back into our usual activities. Uh, and so this is something that uh, the president announced. He brought in what would be termed a vaccine czar, if you will, uh, a uh, Mr. Salawi. He was uh, the former uh, head of GlaxoSmithKline. He was on the Moderna board, which is the company that is developing the vaccine with the NIAID. That's Dr. Fauci's um, uh, group out of NIH. And uh, they're partnering for a vaccine that is uh, actually now gonna enter phase two, which is really exciting. But the whole purpose of this effort is to really bring uh, the, the back, the bear of, of the entire uh, US government. So not only the US Department of Health and Human Services where I was at, but also to bring in the military. Uh, they're having General Perna, I believe, who is from the US Military Supply Command to also uh, help head this in terms of manufacturing as well as distribution. These are real questions that are gonna be ans you know, answered and, and, and needed to be if we are actually gonna get a successful vaccine and get it to the right people who actually need it early on. Do you think um, it's feasible to have it by the end of the year or do you think that we're looking more early next year? Well, you know, either way, both are pretty record breaking if we get it by say end of year uh, or we get it early January. I mean, that is, that's huge. And, you know, historically speaking, vaccine development has taken a long time. I mean, we don't, we still don't have a vaccine for HIV. I mean, there's a lot of vaccine efforts that happen, uh, but it's often a slower pace because you really have to demonstrate two important things. One is safety above all, that the vast, vast majority of people will actually come out safe with this. And that too, it's, it's um, effective, that it's not just a you know, effort in uh, a uselessness that puts you at risk. So both of those criteria, what they're gonna look for in phase one, two, and three. Uh, but by the reports that I am seeing, it seems pretty clear that these are already on a fast track. Moderna had uh, received a BARDA grant, which is the Biomedical Advanced Research uh, Policy Division of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And they also had applied for an IND, which is the Investigational New Drug for FDA, and just got approval for that. So that's pretty exciting. And I think they're estimating, perhaps, if things are, continue to go on the pace that they have been, uh, that they will probably be in phase three, which means that more people will get the testing. The exciting thing about Moderna, in my view, and that could be like from a scientific sort of uh, nerd view, is that it is actually not a live or dead virus. It's in fact a, it's, it's an uh, antigen, it's a protein. So that's exciting. It spurs the immune system, which is our uh, defense mechanism in our body to see it and then to really have the defenses ready, if you will, so that if and when we do get that exposure to the virus, we're, we're well uh, ready to go and fight it. So these are kind of the exciting things. There are also likely about, there's like many, many efforts going around the US and NAT uh, globally in terms of vaccine development. But what they're going to do is they're going to come down and, and, and bear down and figure out which are the top contenders, maybe about 14 vaccine efforts. And there are really important ones that are also going on at Pfizer or uh, over in Oxford in, in England. And they're gonna take some of these top contenders and then really uh, invest the rest of their efforts, which is a lot of resources and a lot of money to really get this vaccine developed. And they also said they're working on a plan to make sure that once they do have it, that it can be distributed right away versus having to wait for that process to be set up. Is that right? 
Exactly. Because, you know, these are all the challenges and the hurdles that we have. We all know between red tape, bureaucracy, uh, all the trials and all these things take so much time. So uh, what it seems like they're doing is they're really going after uh, uh, really making things concurrent simultaneously so that if uh, the vaccine candidate, whichever one it may be, they're already poised to get it manufactured physically, the vial, the product, and then also poised to get it distributed. The manufacturing distribution will likely be similar for uh, at least some of them. And you can think about the distribution already, depending on uh, what what people they think will really benefit from it. So you think of high vulnerable folks, you think of healthcare workers or other frontline heroes of ours, and then you certainly think of kids perhaps who are uh, maybe immunocompromised or very young, but they're gonna be able to get that to them and prioritize so that certainly the, the bad outcomes that we all worry about are minimized. Do you think, do you foresee any challenges here? I mean, obviously it's, it's a challenge to try and find a vaccine and, and make it so quickly, but you know, what are the, some of the hurdles or, or challenges they're gonna face as they try to get to that point? Well, you know, th the challenges are many. Number one is, you know, do things go as they expect? You know, what if it turns out that some of the hopeful candidates actually don't prove uh, safe or uh, as effective as they wanted in phase three? Uh, you know, so those are gonna be some of the things that, I mean, it actually has to be the product that we want. Uh, what if there are holdups? What if there are unexpected events in the vaccine development that they didn't account for, you know, how does that work on the timeline? None of this is going to be easy, but, you know, I was sharing that I think it's like our, when we decided that, hey, we're going to put a man on the moon, I mean, it seemed uh, incredibly uh, bold given the shortened timeline back then, but they did, as we as a nation did prioritize that. And my hope is by bringing all these great minds both scientifically, people have had expertise in this, but also those who have expertise in manufacturing or in clinical trials and bringing them all together to really help uh, address, hey, what are the things that we could do to expedite this? We're certainly giving it the best shot it has. And I think that's really important to know. I've also said that it likely will shift the paradigm of how we even for future infectious disease efforts uh, may in fact um, speed, uh, you know, warp speed things to uh, uh, production so that we can be more effective in how we address this. We know that there are a lot of parts of our government and private sector that have a lot of regulations and red tape, some of them very important, and others kind of unnecessary that have just remained with us, maybe outdated. So this is a really good exercise as a nation to try and advance our science and, and the um, framework of how our science goes from phase one all the way to the patient. Yeah, and you know, obviously the race is on to get a vaccine because you know, so many people have been affected by this, like just the impacts that we have seen happen to um, just the public in general, our economy, and you know, even just shifting gears now to the sailors on board USS Theodore Roosevelt. We understand that they, a, a bunch of them, just tested positive for the coronavirus again, right? So is there, um, what do you think are the issues here? Is it that we didn't get uh, the right protocols in place in time to get these sailors in a safe place? Well, it's interesting because the, the Navy Times, uh, I looked at what their uh, statements were. And in essence, they, they did emphasize that these sailors were uh, isolated. Remember the early on hundreds who were affected on the US Theodore Roosevelt. And then they were on Guam, they were taken off. People went through an isolation protocol, social distancing. And they said that they went through rigorous um, uh, protocols that were uh, above what uh, CDC guidelines. However, as they have incrementally began to bring folks back on. They have, of course, had the news that uh, there are now 13 sailors, I believe, who had uh, retested positive. I think the real interesting issue here, and, and to not speculate and give cause for worry yet, is to really understand what kind of tests did they use that actually showcased that they were negative. And then when they retested and they were supposedly negative twice after quarantine, and then when they brought them on, some folks had symptoms that were flu-like in nature. Uh, those sailors correctly reported that. And then when they were tested yet again, they were positive. So it'd be interesting to see a couple of things. Number one, were the tests, uh, you know, are they false negative rates or false positive? What is the reliability of those tests? Number two, if in fact they were reliable 
is this a virus showcasing perhaps in some subpopulation could it be dormant and becoming reactive again in some people who may have some reason that their immune system might make them prone to that there's all kinds of you know speculate speculation that can come from a science perspective and ultimately is it is it possible to have reinfection meaning maybe there are people who cannot produce the antibody defense mechanism that we expect, or even if they do produce it, it's not adequate to protect them. Those are questions I think would be really important. And I do wanna know if in fact, they had the antibody testing done and maybe they're getting it done now just to see what their serology looks like. Do they have that? So there's a lot of questions also in this, but very interesting news indeed. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to switch gears now to something more local. For our viewers who are watching across the country, just so you know, California is starting to ease some restrictions slowly. And we're taking a more cautious approach compared to the rest of the country. Uh, we know California is easing some restrictions for businesses and manufacturing. And here in the Bay Area, slowly, the majority of Bay Area counties are moving into what's called this phase two. So, um, we, we know that the data was able to help support this decision. That's what our governor has said. And Bay Area Health Officers also saying the same thing. We're looking at the data here. Um, what do you think when you, when you see us moving into phase two, um, what do you think people need to keep in mind as restrictions are eased? Yeah, so really great question because we are now, I mean, it's exciting. We've graduating finally to the phase two reopening, but we need to ensure that folks know that that does not mean that our own duties, our own individual responsibilities should by any means go uh, you know, un unchecked. Um, stay on it, stay vigilant. And I say that be calm and be vigilant because I know it is, it has been a great time of uh, anxiety and stress. And I know people really want to just actually let that go probably for their own personal health. But having said that, you can and are now experts in this realm of social distancing. Like we, we as a society have graduated and really learned the uh, importance of hand hygiene, washing your hands, having that as part of our regular routine is so important because even if you were to touch a, a surface, uh, if you wash your hands, you know, you've done, you've done away with that virus. Uh, and, uh, and ensuring that uh, if we go out, which again, we wanna keep to a minimum, that we are still doing the face coverings, really more to give a sense of confidence to some folks who are more fearful, perhaps because of their own medical condition. But this is just uh, really a, a being a good neighbor in a much, much greater societal way, uh, but also wanting to ensure that we continue to graduate so that those folks who have challenges with their own livelihoods and there are so many people who are very, very worried about what their own future looks like economically, the financial hardships that we ensure that we're giving them the best chance because that's been a whole other issue in terms of what uh, people have come across. And so the, the sooner we're back at it, I think the more confidence we have as a society that we'll get through this. And when you look at the, at the data yourself, I mean, are you surprised that we're moving into phase two or you feel like we're kind of right on track of where we should be? I, I think we are right on track. The upside of this is that we have been uh, a little bit more conservative than other states. And uh, so that's, that's a good thing. I mean, people are also itching to get there, but our numbers have gone in the correct direction of down. Our hospitalizations have definitely gone down. Our, our hospitals are not by any means overburdened. Our supplies have definitely come up. And, and as long as we stay on this, you know, we have a, a great chance to feel like uh, we can, as a whole, make an impact on this virus and uh, really ensure that we are also prepped for the summer and the fall uh, and that we can um, hopefully slowly get to that, proving to ourselves that the data is in our favor. Yeah, and I think one of the big things is what, which remains to be seen is making sure that um, there's not a resurgence, right? Like if we loosen these restrictions and then there's another resurgence here, and that's kind of one of the concerns of the governor. But what do you, what can you say, or what do you know of from other states, for example, that have already loosened some restrictions and people are going out and about and going to restaurants and gyms and, you know, what, what have we seen come out of those states? Yeah, so we've heard about so many states around the country because this really is a, a decision that has been left to the governor since they understand their states better. They know what hotspots they've had. They can talk to their public health uh, experts, et cetera, in different counties. And so we know that there's an advantage to that. These states that have moved forward uh, have had the numbers and feel that they can uh, handle it. Florida, I look at always because 
It's a state that is, has sunny beaches and something that we Californians can relate to, uh, but on the other hand has a higher elderly population, but they have a means that they're addressing it. I understand they've been uh, focused on nursing homes and really ensuring that they've been proactive in, in that manner. So uh, I think so far they're proving that they can do this. There is an emphasis, of course, as they will be here in terms of ramping up the testing, but also contact tracing. Why is that so important? Because ultimately we know that there's going to be new cases of viruses. That's that's not the issue. The issue is that it should not turn into uh, a, an outbreak, that's something that gets ahead of us, that we're able to respond to an outbreak in any specific part of the, of the state of California and contain it. Make sure that it is, it is well contained, that it does not end up into a situation that is um, out of our hands and again, burdens our health facilities in other places. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning in this vaccine. I mean, do you feel like and a lot, until there is a vaccine, even though restrictions are being eased, this is basically our new normal until a vaccine is found? Well, I think our original plan was really to flatten the curve uh, so that uh, we didn't have this uh, increase in surge in cases that while we were getting prepared and increasing our stockpiles and really understanding what are the characteristics of this virus, that we were not caught flat-footed. So it's true in some parts of, say, New York, for example, that uh, because of probably any number of reasons that will come out uh, soon, because you know people are studying this, New York got overwhelmed. But by and large, we were able to give our health uh, care hospitals and clinics a chance to catch up uh, by really actually minimizing all, almost all health care and, and focusing on COVID. Uh, we've, you know, we've definitely, we've done that and uh, we've shown that we can flatten the curve and make a difference. Uh, the, the real thing is, is that uh, I think we have an advantage compared to where we were before. We, where we were before, when all this started, is it was a brand new virus, something that we were not clear on what its characteristics were. And we, not, we did not as a nation ever implement this pandemic uh, response that we have seen everywhere, which is just amazing. So now I think we're in a better situation where the folks in our country know what it means to say hand hygiene, social distancing, face masks. Uh, and also we understand the virus before it was purely novel. I mean, we really had no idea about its characteristics. We're definitely more knowledgeable now. There's a lot more to learn, but we're definitely in a better position. So the idea is really to keep that resurgence, which we may again have some viral outbreaks that we keep contained, slow down that transmission, and most important than anything, really protect our vulnerable, who are the ones who, to have the most likely bad outcomes to really protect them. Okay, sounds good. We're gonna leave it at that because I don't wanna take up too much of your time, but we appreciate your thoughts and insight as always. Dr. Vanilla Singh, former me Chief Medical Officer of the U.S. Health and Human Services and Clinical Associate Professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. As always, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Christina.